in the name of my ancestors, peace forever and always. Welcome to another edition of the Realities Temple on Earth. I am the gatekeeper of this internet ministry known as the mighty, mighty, mighty Angel Snub Love 7, your brother and hopefully your friend, Talik Even Ra. I hope that you enjoy the feature that follows this introduction. And I appreciate your views, I appreciate your support, and like always, think for yourself. With that said, the feature presentation begins right now. Take it easy. I'll see you later and respect you. Dr. Jack Kevorkian died earlier today. Uh, he's been in and out of the hospital the past few weeks. He had pneumonia in an Oak Park hospital, I think. He died earlier. He was 83. Now, all Americans should know who Dr. Kevorkian is. Uh, I'm probably more susceptible to hearing about him since I'm from Detroit and he operated for Michigan. Um, but if you're living under a rock and don't know who he is, he's a doctor who advocated and practiced assisted suicide and participated in about 130 assisted suicides. Um, what would happen is that someone with a terminal illness would approach Kevorkian and ask for his assistance, uh, sometimes beg for his assistance to put them out of their own misery. There's a lot of documented cases of people who are simply depressed and wanted Kevorkian to assist in their suicide, and Kevorkian turned him down. Um, now, what Kevorkian did was illegal, of course, because suicide is illegal. Now, obviously, the person who died can't go to trial, but the person who, or in this case, the accessory, would face legal ramifications for assisting in the illegal suicide. He faced trial in 1998 and was found guilty of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 10 to 25 years in prison. Um, now, I'm not going to get into the fact that he defended himself in court instead of having Jeffrey Figer as his lawyer, who always got him off, but Kevorkian got out in 2008 and still actively participated in groups that advocated the legalization of assisted suicide. He faced a lot of time in prison for doing that. So, let's think about this. A grown adult with, say, Huntington's disease, which is a disease I would never wish on my worst enemy, is in terrifying pain, death is assured, usually a painful one, and they voluntarily approach Dr. Kevorkian and ask him to help him die quick and painlessly. Dr. Kevorkian reviews the case, they make a video saying goodbye to his or her loved ones, and the doctor administers some sort of agent that puts them out of their own misery. And he gets in trouble for this? He should be revered and commended for this. It's not like he went seeking for people, walking up to patients in hospitals saying, hey, you want to die? We are the owners of our own body. We have dominion over our physical selves. And if we make the personal, voluntarily, voluntary choice to end our own lives, government should have no say-so whatsoever. None. The state telling you that you cannot end your own life is the state telling you that your body ultimately belongs to them. And they do. In 1997, this issue was brought before the U.S. Supreme Court in Washington v. Glucksburg, and the court voted unanimously that assisted suicide was not protected under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, which guarantees people the right to, quote, life, liberty, and property. Of course, ending one's own life is upholding liberty, and most would agree that your own body is your own, quote, property. So, assisted suicide should have been covered under the Due Process provision. Um, the Supreme Court should be ashamed, especially Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, and John Paul Stevens, and David Soder. I could see Antonin Scalia, Clarence Thomas, and William Rehnquist voting against it, but not the rest. So legal argument, unless you're an open authoritarian who thinks that our bodies are agents of the state, the legal argument is weak, very weak. Kevorkian's main opponents were, of course, religious people. The types of religious people that want to make their opinions, which of course are totally unfounded, the law. They wanted to impose their own personal religious beliefs on the rest of the country, which would restrict rights. 
Now, I have my own op opinions about religion, and I feel that I could defend them quite well. But I would never dream of restricting anyone's rights who have different uh, religious opinions than me. If you're against assisted suicide, well, here's a crazy idea. Don't kill yourself, but don't tell other people that they can't. We are individuals and should have individual freedom as long as they aren't affecting the freedoms of others. Besides, there's freedom of religion in this country. Uh, your beliefs on suicide are not universally shared, and for good reason. You know, you have to take circumstances into account when talking about something as complex as suicide. Uh, then again, reason and logic are thrown out the window when you're talking to religious fundamentalists anyway. Now, the abortion argument, as pro-choice as I am regarding abortion, I can see the pro-life side. I get their argument, and they have a respectable position. But the people who are against assisted suicide, I don't see any legitimacy on their side at all, and I don't respect it at all. We're talking about our own personal lives that we personally would decide to end if it would ever come to, down to that, and hopefully it never would. But that is our decision, and the government has no say-so whatsoever in making that decision for us. Now, I think that Dr. Kevorkian was a man who was ahead of his time. I consider him a hero because he was such an advocate for personal freedom and personal autonomy. I, I'll always advocate what he fought for, and I just hope the next generation realizes how ridiculous the anti-assisted suicide laws are and eventually repeal them. Or if the correct Supreme Court justices get appointed, they will legalize it across all 50 states. Three years from now, the court will look significantly different than the 1997 Supreme Court. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg will probably step down soon, and within the next five years, Antonin Scalia and Anthony Kennedy probably won't be on the court anymore. Uh, so I think that uh, history will judge Jack of Orkin as a good man and as a man who is correct. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, this is really all I got to say. Uh, leave any comments in the section in the comment box. And thanks again for watching. Watching. Or is that the only one you have? Because I'll just give well, like... I've read an unpublished uh, novel. Oh, really? Do you want me to? I'll mention that. Um, no, you don't have to. It's not important. Cause, uh, I, mean, I don't know if I'm ever gonna try to play it out. Oh, okay. Um, do you have a website or anything that I could? Yeah, FBI War on Tupac dot com www.fdiwaronTupac.com Do you spell it T-U-P-A-C or 2-P-A-C? Uh, T-U-P-A-C. Okay. And uh, anything else you want me to announce uh, at the beginning? Uh, that, well, is a, a DVD now based on the book that I've produced. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll definitely mention that here. Kind of film based on the book. Sure. All right. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Anton Beatty and the co-host Larry, and we have a special guest with us today. Uh, he wrote a book, an uh, intriguing book, uh, The FBI War on Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders. Um, you could reach him at his website, FBIWarOnTupac.com. Uh, he also has a DVD coming out that's based on the book. Mr. John Potash, thanks for being on the show. Glad to be here with you. Good. Now, there is a uh, a lot of talk about the uh, the death of Tupac and Tupac's. Uh, we know from a lot of his earlier songs, he talked a lot about social systems and social justice. Could you basically give us a brief premise of the book and what the book is about? It's yeah, roughly well, two hundred pages, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah. A little under two hundred pages, and then there's seventy pages of endnotes to show where all the source information came from, and it is mostly mainstream media sources. Huh. So I had to, you know, untangle it from mainstream media sources, and I did over a hundred interviews and got uh, CIA and FBI and court documents to prove most of the stuff I have in there. But basically, what I'd say is, in, in analyzing Tupac's life through interviews and all the mentioned sources, I found that his, him and his family, uh, looking at them and the targeting of them, is a good window into the targeting of black leaders. Um, and other ethnic leaders of the last four decades and how U.S. intelligence murderously targeted all these leaders. Now, the subtitle of the book is U.S. Intelligence's Murderous Targeting of Tupac, MLK, Malcolm, Panthers, Hendrix, Marley, Rappers, and Linked Ethnic Leftists. And I show how some of the same tactics were used against all these people mentioned, and particularly, though, against Tupac and his family. And mm. you can... His uh, family, the targeting of his family, overlaps the targeting of the, the, the major you know, black leaders of the last 40 years, including, as I said, Malcolm X, sure. 
and uh, Malcolm X's father was involved with Marcus Garvey, right. while um, Fania Shakur's uh, father-in-law was uh, part of Marcus Garvey's group, the UNIA, mm -hmm. and uh, and then became part of Malcolm, a close associate of Malcolm X's, and then um, his son, and his name was uh, Sayyidin Abba Shakur. His son was Lumumba Shakur, mm -hmm. who became part of Malcolm X's group right before he died, and then uh, uh, Lumumba Shakur was made a Harlem Black Panther leader, and then when he went to jail, Fani Shakur uh, was elected Harlem Black Panther leader. Of course, Fani Shakur is Tupac's mother. Right. He, he read a huge amount of books. Uh, Michael, Professor Michael Eric Dyson right. outlined hundreds and hundreds of PhD level books that he found in in uh, Tupac's library where he mm -hmm. was living as a teenager you know, because he had moved out from his mother's house when she had gotten uh, addicted to crack and right. you know things weren't good there. What's your view on his his death? Uh, my view is that U.S. intelligence orchestrated his death. Hmm. They, um, you know, this is supported by the fact that um, an FBI agent said that he he had documents to prove that FBI were in the motorcade, you know, when Tupac was killed. That watched his death to make sure everything went as planned. So, um, you know, there's a high-level Los Angeles police detective who said that his fellow police officers uh, murdered Tupac, and then they murdered Biggie to make it look like an East Coast versus West Coast rap war versus, um, you know, police killing Tupac. Um, so you think the government was behind Biggie's death, too? I do. It's you know, what you might call collateral damage. It right. to, to, uh, well, you know, partly maybe because uh, Biggie was a very bright and, you know, great rapper but I mean you know he he, he, didn't, he rapped about more negative stuff though sure. he was a bright guy of course um, but I think it was more so just to um, look make Tupac's death look like uh, part of this East Coast West Coast rap war and uh, cover up Tupac's um, assassination mm -hmm. versus um, more of a political murder what, was, what do you think Suge Knight's role in the, in the uh, killing was? Well, well my evidence uh, in the show that he was kind of a lower man on the totem pole in U.S. intelligence machinations because, you know, obviously he was in line of fire. Now, the fact that those gunmen were so careful not to kill Suge Knight also shows that, you know, he may have been lined in line of fire, but they purposely, you know, avoided killing him. Um, so he was lower man on the totem pole. When you look at all the evidence, you see Death Row Records is really a, a U.S. intelligence front company. <laughs> And um, not only to help set up the assassination of Tupac Shakur, but also to traffic drugs and run guns and to try to uh, you know, cause conflict and chaos in a lot of the rap community and trouble for a lot of, you know, for a number of political rappers. So they had a, a really big agenda. And um, not, to, not to put anything past Dr. Dre, he was a great creative force, but I think he was duped being the great creative force of Death Row, and then, you know, of course, he left with nothing. Sure. Um, and so Snoop Dogg, same thing, great rapper, but, um, you know, he, he had to leave there with a death threat. Um, and, you know, he was beaten by uh, Death Row guards after he left, and so and he left scared for his life, and there was, you know, uh, death threats on Death Row website against Snoop Dogg. Right. So, yeah, so... Yeah, a lot of the... Um, I'm a big fan of the declassified FBI uh, and CIA records, um, especially about Malcolm X, uh, one of my heroes from... Uh, oh, no, yeah. still is, obviously. Yeah. But... Um, Claiborne Carson had a real good book on the FBI file. Oh, I'm not going to mention the FBI file. Oh, yeah. Hello? Hello? Yeah, Oh yeah, I just dropped the phone. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah. That's right um, Malcolm X. There is, a, of course, a body of evidence about you know the declassified FBI files that you could read. Sure. And he was obviously a threat. You know what he was doing in uh, what he threatened yeah. to do in the UN, what he was planning to do in the UN. Um, yeah. Of course, and what he was doing, uh, you know, in the United States with the MMA. Well, yeah, he's, yeah. It, but the thing about Tupac is that. As much of a fan I am of him, and as exciting as what your what the premise of your book is about, seems like you're turning Tupac into something that he wasn't as much. Especially the last year of his life, I don't I don't really see how he was any type of political threat. In fact, if you read the uh, the records of COINTELPRO, 
it talks about how they want to dissuade the uh, the rise of a black messiah, someone who could unify, uh, especially the black community. And if you look at Tupac's life from when he got out of prison until until he died, he was doing everything contrary to that premise. He was causing division in the black community. I can remember when he was alive. I mean, it's not like he is now, where he is some unified force after death. While he actually was alive, he was he was a divider. Yeah, see, I think he was a it was a real unifier before prison. Um, you know, he he called out. You know, he gave props to tons of rappers in um, his first two or three albums. You know, first two or three CDs, and uh, you can hear that in his lyrics. It was only after. See, he he was. Uh, they put agents all around him in, in prison. I believe um, they used the same tactics when he renewed when he was in prison, and they they created they manufactured this this. East Coast versus West Coast rap war the same way they manufactured the East Coast versus West Coast Black Panther war. Well, Tupac perpetuated yeah. it, so it seems like Tupac would be he falling right in line with what they said, so why would they want to kill him because of that? Yeah, no, you're right. He was duped. But towards the, the end of that, see, he was only out of jail for um, about 11 months. Yeah, right. And and at the end of that 11 months, he said, I'm going to stop saying W to mean West Coast, but to mean, uh, uh, to mean war. Um, for black America, you know, against uh, you know, racism, against the uh, white oppression. I don't oppression know, about a week before stuff. he died, he gave an interview with Robert Marriott, and he was still uh -huh. talking about Biggie, and he was still talking about the East-West. That was about a week before he died. Already people can't look at Biggie and not laugh. No. Oh, yeah. you, you I took every piece of his power. Heard that shit. All I want to do is take them to where I was when they didn't want to support me. And I, there will be no support. And anybody that try to help them, I will destroy. Whether it's whoever it is, I will destroy. That's what I'm doing. Everybody that try to side with him or do a record with him or try to unify with him, I'm going to destroy. I swear to God. Can't nobody touch me right now. Maybe next month all of this will be over. But this month, I'm taking every moving target out. Because this is a very personal thing for me, and I feel like people should have gave me my respect. Y'all know I was not like this before. Right, right. I did not attack people. I, I was not on no East Coast, West Coast. Right. I was the major bridge between the East Coast and the West Coast. Before he died, he gave an interview with Robert Marriott, and he was still uh -huh. talking about Biggie, and he was still talking about the East West. That was about a week before he died. And the day that he got shot on September the 7th in Las Vegas, uh -huh. Tupac... This is why I think he died. I, I don't think his death was a result of any conspiracy. It was because it was a simple uh, gang war that Tupac interjected himself into. Now, the conspiracy theories don't sound fun that Suge Knight killed him, you know, because Tupac yeah, was supposedly well. leaving. But the conspiracy, I think that Tupac died in his prime. He was a voice uh -huh. for a lot of segments of society. People can't grasp the fact that he died as a result of his own doing, his own interjecting himself into a gang war. So they create these conspiracy theories because it sounds cool and because it sounds exciting. The last year of Tupac's life, so if you, it sounds like you're familiar with the COINTELPRO documents and all that, yeah. Tupac was not. Tup Many believe that this man is God Almighty, the Supreme Being, Allah in person. His followers call him Master Farad Muhammad. He's the founder of the Nation of Islam, a group started in Detroit in 1930. The man who taught that was this man, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, I'm going to prove, using logic, reason, and common sense, that this man, Farad Muhammad, is not God Almighty. According to Elijah Muhammad in his book, Message to the Black Man in America, on page 92, he refers to God as, quote, the All-Knowing One. In one of his other books, Our Savior Has Arrived, on page 16, he claimed that God is, quote, all-wise, all-knowing, and all-powerful. On page 56 of that same book, Elijah Muhammad said that this man, Farad Muhammad, is the all-knowing supreme being. Later on page 99, he claimed that Farad Muhammad's, quote, wisdom is infinite. So according to Elijah Muhammad, this man, Farad Muhammad, had infinite wisdom and was all-knowing and was all-powerful. Now, this is an interesting claim to make about a man who is not able to spell elementary words correctly. This is a letter that Master Farad Muhammad sent to Elijah Muhammad on December 18th, 1933. You can see it at the official Muhammad Speaks website, and the link is posted in the description. It's a letter full of spelling, grammatical, and punctuation errors that would make any educated person cringe reading it. Farad Muhammad spelled basic words like against, lion, profession, successful, remember, to, terrible, 
in many other words, incorrectly. So according to Elijah Muhammad, this quote, all-knowing, infinitely wise, almighty God, couldn't even spell the word lion correctly? There's also a lot of scribbles, which signify a mistake. I thought God Almighty was perfect. Going back, reminding you that Elijah Muhammad said that God is all-knowing, and then saying Farad is God, thus making him all-knowing and all-wise, Elijah Muhammad contradicts himself on page 157 of his book, Our Savior Has Arrived, and said that not even Farad Muhammad knows when Jesus was born. He said that Farad knew that it was between the first and second weeks of September. Then Elijah Muhammad said, quote, No man knows exactly what day he was born, not even Farad, whom he earlier, on page 16 and 99, said was all-knowing. So Elijah Muhammad himself disqualified Farad from being God, since Elijah Muhammad said that one of the attributes of being God Almighty is to be all-knowing and all-wise. He also contradicted himself when he said that Farad Muhammad knows 16 languages and is able to write 10. Now, what's interesting is that Elijah Muhammad said this, and he was actually trying to brag how wise Farad was. And unbelievable, no one bothered to ask him, Hey Elijah, if Farad is God Almighty, why didn't he know all the languages? There's roughly 4,000 languages in the world, and Farad supposedly knew only 16? That's not even one half of 1% of humanity's languages. So Farad Muhammad was ignorant of 99% of humanity's languages, but he's the all-knowing, all-wise God. Now on a more comical note, Elijah claimed that Farad's handwriting in Arabic is the, quote, best writing or penmanship in the Arab world. Now, if we can base his penmanship and handwriting in English as an indication, we know that's a lie. Look how sloppy this Farad's handwriting was in English. Then there's a debate that Farad Muhammad had with Albert Einstein in 1933, where when Farad was asked about whether there's a difference between sensitivity and awareness, Farad said, quote, I wonder if there's a difference. Wait, what do you mean you wonder? Doesn't wonder mean that you're not sure? Doesn't wonder mean that you don't know with 100% accuracy? Is this the same all-wise Farad Muhammad that Elijah spoke of in Our Savior Has Arrived? An all-knowing being who has to wonder about a basic philosophical question. Your wisdom is infinite and you're all-knowing, but you have to wonder about something. In that same interview, he wrongly said that 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza was 45 years old when he died, and not his real age, which was 44. All, and when I say all, I literally mean every single source on Spinoza, has his birth date, is in November 1632, and has his death in February 1677. That makes somebody 44, not 45, as Farad said. Now, in parentheses, it does have the two years of his birth and death. So what Farad did, obviously, was just subtracted the two numbers and figured that that was his age when he died and didn't take into consideration the months that are involved, too. But I challenge anyone, anyone, to find me a single source that disputes that Spinoza was born in November of 1632 and died in February of 1677. Farad was simply wrong, and if he was wrong, even about something as minuscule as age when Spinoza died, that automatically disqualifies him as being the all-knowing God Almighty. There's other serious contradictions like that, but I'll leave at this for now and challenge anyone to explain this, especially the misspelled words. I was a better speller than your God Almighty when I was in fifth grade than when he was a grown man pretending to be some prophet. So who was this Farad Muhammad character? He was Wallace Ford. The FBI files clearly prove this. Now there's two points about the FBI files. First off, the investigation on Farad was done under the FBI's COINTELPRO, which was an enormously illegal and covert operation which carried out unlawful acts and investigations on leaders of groups they subjectively considered, quote, subversive. The FBI took it very serious. They spent millions of dollars on COINTEL, and they never assumed the files would one day be declassified where just anyone could read them on the internet, which is proof that the files contain mostly accurate information. There's no point for members of the FBI to lie to each other since they're essentially on the same team regarding these issues. So the content within these files are mostly accurate, with a few errors. The FBI was mostly honest within themselves, although the operation itself was dishonest. The second point is that there's many members of the Nation of Islam who accept my premise and actually try to use the FBI files to disprove that Farad Muhammad and Wallace D. Ford are the same person. Now, before I go there, a picture speaks a thousand words, and just look at these pictures, for goodness sake. First of all, these two men are clearly the same person. They're taken from a few years apart, but it's incredibly obvious they're the same person. The chin, the hairline, they both have a mole by their left nostril. These two guys are clearly the same people, which means these two guys are the same people. 
Obviously, these two guys are the same people. Obviously, these two guys are the same people. The one on the left is from when Farad was going to San Quentin prison for trying to sell drugs to an undercover cop in 1926. And the other one on the right is when he was arrested in Detroit in May 1933. At any rate, if these two guys are the same, that means, sorry, that these two guys are the same too. Um, and just on a side comical note, Elijah Muhammad also said in, in 1963 that he spoke with Farad just a few days ago. Right. Now, to those who claim that the FBI said that they did not conclude that Wallace D. Farad and Wallace D. Ford are the same people, need to actually read the FBI files. The FBI said plenty of times that they are the same person. The FBI said that Wally Ford was arrested in, 19, in November 1918 is, quote, identical to Wally Ford, which was arrested and convicted in San Quentin in 1926, and identical to Wallace Farad. Identical, according to the FBI. Another one, Farad, whose exact identity has been established, was arrested by the Detroit Police Department in 1933 in connection to the cold activities of the Temple of Islam in that city. And again, here's another one. They said that Wallace Ford, arrested in Chicago in September 33, appears to be, quote, identical with Wallace Farad. Another one says that W.D. Farad had a son, Wallace D. Wallace Dodd Ford on September 1st, 1920, speaking under the correct assumption that Ford and Farad are the same people. They said that Farad was arrested in May 1933. One of the aliases he gave was Ford. Another part says Wallace, Wallace Farad, a.k.a. Wally Ford. There's one that says Wallace Dodd Ford used an alias like W.D. Farad, Wallace Farad, and other names Farad used. This one says that Dodd is known as Wallace Dodd Ford, also known as W.D. Farad. This one's pretty interesting. It says that, quote, Farad indicated that he was arrested by the Los Angeles, California Police Department and is Wally Ford, this guy, in November of 1918. There are a lot more passages in the FBI file just like this. So clearly, the FBI thought that they were the same people. Now, there's many members of the Nation of Islam that will point to the place in the FBI file where it said, quote, it was not definitely determined whether the individual referred to in paragraph 5 above was identical to the subject of the summary. Now, I think it's really important that they actually read the entire 20-page memo. The person they're referring to in paragraph 5 is a lead where someone told the FBI that a man named Muhammad was receiving mail, and the FBI said that they could not, quote, definitely determine if Muhammad was indeed Farad Muhammad. I mean, the name of this particular file is, quote, Wallace Don Ford, and right at the beginning, they list the many aliases that Wallace Don Ford used, like Farad Muhammad, Wallace Farad, Wallace D. Farad, etc. So the FBI, while preparing this document, like before, is under the correct assumption that Farad and Ford are the same people. People need to read these documents. To deny these two men are the same, you're saying that it's a huge coincidence that there was some guy out there who was a spitting image of Farad, whose name was almost identical to Farad, one being Wallace D. Ford and the other one being Wallace D. Farad. And it just so happens that as soon as this guy Wallace Ford is released from San Quentin in 1929, just months later, this guy with almost the exact same name and exact same look appears in Detroit as Wallace Farad. It's a coincidence that Wallace Ford's common-law wife, Hazel Barton, said she received mail from him in Chicago and Detroit, two places where Farad Muhammad was known to be. It's just a big coincidence that the height and weight of Farad and Ford are the exact same, with only one report fluctuating about 10 pounds and roughly an inch or so. It's also a big coincidence that Ford and Farad have almost the exact same birthday, as Ford's birthday is February 25th and Farad's birthday is February 26th. It's also a coincidence that Wallace Ford started to eat one meal a day, as he told Hazel Barton when he saw her the last time. It's also a big coincidence that when Nation of Islam members were shown by the FBI the picture of the man whom Elijah denies as Farad, they say the opposite, that it was indeed. I'll talk about a revisionist view of Nazi Germany, because it's something, you know, I'd, I'd get in discussions with a few people. In, in meat space from time to time. The problem is though that uh, a lot most people will accept that yes, Nazi Germany was a um, peculiar combination of mundane social forces and we shouldn't believe in Nazi Germany as being some special, magical, mystical, phantasmagorical evil, but recognize that this is just a product of, of what humans do, what normal rational humans can do when when certain 
factors are at play. And most people will agree with that model, but then when you try to, you know, talk about the German perspective throughout the war and how, you know, to Nazi Germany just about everything they did was justified and all that stuff, you know, you start to get people saying, yeah, okay, I may or may not agree with you, but why are you talking about this? Are you some sort of Nazi revisionist? Are you some sort of... And... And, um... And so I look at that stuff. And so for my first podcast, I guess I'll just talk about uh, Nazi Germany in World War II. Now, to understand Nazi Germany, you basically need to understand World War I. Well, World War I, you had all the alliances, all the alliances going at each other and the, and the stumbling into war. You know, uh, Serbia declares war. Serbia kills some Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Austria declares war on Serbia. Russia declares war on Austria. Germany declares war on Russia. Germany then declares war on France and Britain to get to get the uh, you know surprise to take the first move on the Western powers. So then you have World War One, and they fight and fight and fight. Germany knocks Russia out of the war by sending Lenin to Saint Petersburg and causing revolution, and then Germany and then Germany sends a bunch of troops over from the Eastern Front over to the Western Front. And they do this, so they have a whole bunch, so now they have a glut of troops, but Germany also has uh, put together a bunch of stormtrooper battalions. Toward the end of the war, um, Germany was basically on the clock to capture Paris and uh, Dunkirk, or was it Calais, or some port up there. And so they were basically on the clock saying, we need to take this town, this town, this town, this town, and then we can win the war. And, they were, and the reason they were on the clock saying, we got to take all these towns, is because the Americans were showing up. Now, you know, these stormtroopers were actually kind of interesting because these stormtroopers would actually go in and around all through the uh, trenches and stuff, and, and, they, and they would, you know, cause complete havoc. And they do a lot of damage themselves, but really what they do is they, dis, is they distract and, um, the troops in the trenches. So, by the time, so when the main wave came over, uh, there wouldn't be a whole lot of... Uh, Allied troops firing at the Germans when the main wave came over, and a lot. And I've actually heard of stories where uh, the guys, like like German, like the German stormtroopers, would cause a bunch of mayhem in the British trenches, and then the main wave would come, and the and the British troops wouldn't even see the main wave. The main wave would just be upon them, and and, and it'd be too late. So that's good. so I so uh, Germany was going to win that war. If America hadn't showed up into that war, Germany was going to win that war. Well, why did America? enter that war. Huh. If you look at sentiment at the time, there wasn't, there was uh, more pro-British French sentiment than there was pro-German sentiment, but it wasn't an overwhelming amount of sentiment, not until the Lusitania. Now, the Lusitania, an interesting thing about the Lusitania, I don't know if the shipping company that the Lusitania was in took out an ad, or if the Kriegsmarine actually took out an ad in a New York newspaper saying, board this ship at your own risk. It's going to enter, you know, uh, enemy waters. It could be torpedoed and it could be, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of badness done to it. So the Lusitania actually had, um, you know, the passengers on Lusitania had more than fair warning when they were uh, buying their tickets to board the Lusitania. Also, the Lusitania was carrying war supplies at the time the Lusitania was was sunk, um, the Allied powers, uh, the Allied powers um, denied it, but later front, but later uh, like divers went down and actually saw yes, they actually did have war materials to be sent to Great Britain, so um, the Allies were actually cloaking a passenger liner, filling it with war materials, which was a clear violation of the rules of war that they said that Germany had, you know, had to abide by. <sighs> Uh, another and and another thing uh, that they were, that, that that was used to um, get the war going was the supposed Zimmerman telegram. Was the supposed telegram where Germany said to Mexico, Mexico, if you declare war on the United States, then once we win the war in Europe, we will sail across the Atlantic, kick the crap out of the United States, and make sure that you get the west to get the Southwest United States back. So Britain said that Germany sent that telegram to Mexico. And that was and that was a reason why the United States was going to declare war on Germany. Both of these things are absolutely retarded. 
Okay, the Zimmerman te telegram is an absurd fake on its face, and the Lusitania, um, you know, I don't believe, I'm an anarchist, so I don't believe in the moral validity of states, but just going along with the gag for now, just saying, okay, state, just assuming states are, are moral just for the sake of this analysis, I would say that um, those people on the Lusitania knew what they were getting into, and Germany did not violate the rules of the states. Assuming states are valid, which they are not, but just for the just going along with the gag because I can't I can't work anarchy into a historical analysis. Otherwise, it'll just be more convoluted than this podcast already is because it's not scripted. I'm just talking off the top of my head. And so, obviously, these um, <laughs> these uh, Gulf of Tonkins, these um, reasons, these rationales to get the United States into war are are were complete nonsense. Now, why were they put out? Well, there's two things to keep in mind. Uh, one is the Balfour Declaration, where was it Rothschild? Was Lord Wa Lord uh, Lord Rothschild made a deal with some Zionist group saying, "We'll, you know, establish a Jewish state in the Mandate of Palestine, and you'll have your and you'll have your Jewish land." And so the Zionists were like, "Yay! Now we'll now we'll you know do whatever we can in the media to try to get the United States into the war." Also, I do know that. Uh, American war, loan, war loans to Britain outnumbered war loans to Germany 30 to 1. So combine the Balfour Declaration with the 30 to 1 war loans, I don't know, it, it's, it's pretty clear what the, how you say, elites wanted the United States to do. So basically, a, a whole bunch of Americans went over and died in Western Europe prolonged the war because it would have been quicker if Germany had just won that war. They prolonged the war, killed a bunch of Americans, killed a bunch more Germans, British, and French. A whole lot more Germans had to die because of that. Basically, a whole bunch of more people died because, because the banksters in the United States inappropriately evaluated risk. They thought that that uh, the French and the British and the Russians combined would crush Germany, and they did not. Uh, they inappropriately evaluated the strength of the armies, the strength of, of the countries, and and so they they were about to get burned. Uh, Britain and France were about to default, were go were going to default on all those war loans if they had lost the war. That was like the uh, the the deal of the war. If you lose the war, then then they don't have to pay the war loans. So basically, World War One was just one big giant bailout. Now, obviously, looking at this, looking at how you, the United States got into the war, you need to realize that you know, media, media banking, and uh, Zionist groups uh, tend to be disproportionately Jewish. Also, keep in mind that the uh, the hierarchy of the Soviet Union was about 50% Jewish. And the Soviet Union was had abolished Christianity in, in the Soviet Union and was proceeding to starve a whole lot of Russian Christian peasants. So combine all these things, um, uh, justified or not, uh, Germans ended up getting rather peeved at Jews worldwide, Jews in general, and so Adolf, and so you have the the Versailles Treaty, the retarded, insane Versailles Treaty, and so Adolf Hitler comes to power. Okay, Adolf Hitler comes to power and puts in place a retarded economic policy. It's an absolutely, uh, he's basically, it's basically a New Deal, except that instead of deficit spending, he's depleting the gold reserve. So he's depleting the gold reserves, creating all these no-value, busy work jobs, and because, and creating a bunch of public works jobs, some of which, and public works do have, it's not like they have no economic value, but the fact that the market isn't doing them means that, um, uh, means that they're not worth it, and so they weren't worth it. And so what ended up happening is that German wages became worth less, and because you had all this public work spending, you had all this money being fused into the economy. But the thing is, nobody 
cares about public works, people weren't benefiting from the public works, and so the standard of living in Germany actually fell under under Nazi Germany. For any given uh, amount of Reichsmarks, um, it was worth it wasn't worth as much because people weren't engaged in productive labor. You know, your Reichsmark couldn't buy as much stuff people actually wanted. And so the inevitable result of all this public spending on, on useless work was basically, it's, you're basically like printing money, okay? Because you're putting in more money than the value you're getting out. The, the, the inevitable result of that is going to be inflation. The value of each Reichsmark is going to be less and less and less because you paid, you know, basically you, you say, all right, we're going to build public works for this bridge. Okay, so basically you pay 100 Reichsmarks for uh, 25 Reichsmarks worth of value. The result is now you have 100 more Reichsmarks in the economy, but only 25 Reichsmarks worth more value. Therefore, each Reichsmark is going to be worth less. You see how that works? And so that's how this priming the pump, this public spending, results in massive inflation. Now, this was tempered to a little bit in Germany in that the Reichsmarks was backed by gold. I think. Was it backed by gold? I don't know. Maybe I should look that up. But but it wouldn't matter anyway. There'd still be inflation. And so there was inflation, massive inflation. But Hitler said, oh, no, we can't have inflation in Germany. That's what happened in the Weimar Republic, and that was disastrous. And so to eliminate the inflation, he basically said, there will be no inflation. And he put in place price controls. And the result of price controls was, you guessed it, food shortages. And so there were food shortages in Germany as a result of the price controls, and the price controls were a result of the inflation, and the inflation was a result of the... Priming the pump, so Germany was an economic basket case. All these state meddling is—it was—it it, it was like a German fetish uh, thing. It's like like con contorted in all these directions, like price controls, public work spending, inflation. It was just this this, this absolute mess. And so there were food shortages, and there were Germans, you know, getting hungry. And when the people are getting hungry, that's not good for the people in power. And so Hitler saw these, saw that a bunch of people were going hungry as a result of his price controls. And so he realized, well, I need to remove these price controls. But I can't remove these price controls without looking like a complete ass. So what he did was he said, all right, I got to do something to focus attention away from these price controls and, and the food shortages and the starvation, and then once attention is focused away from them, then I'll repeal the price controls. It was at this time that he re, that the German troops marched into the Rhineland, remilitarized the Rhineland, and while everyone was looking at the Rhineland and throwing you know all these celebrations, oh, Germany is united again, and all this stuff, then Hitler repealed the price controls kind of, you know, behind the scenes, okay, keep looking, keep looking, don't realize what a fucktard I am, what a buffoon I am. And then they seize Austria, and <laughs> seizing Austria, you know, Austrian, a lot of Austrians today will say, oh, we were attacked by Nazi Germany, oh, Nazi Germany forced us to be a part of them, oh, woe is us, oh, how we were... We were not complicit. We were just forced at the point of a gun by the goose stepping. And but the thing is, Nazis, uh, Austrian soldiers enlisted in the German army at about the same rate as the German so soldiers. So they'll say that now, but at the time, you know, there there was a fascist part. You know, there were like two main factions in Austria at that time. There were the Nazi Party. They're the Austrian Nazis. And there was the uh, another fascist party, so it was basically fascist or fascist. So they were, you know, they were they were there. The Austrians were there anyway, and so the Nazis showed up, and most Austrians greeted them with open arms. And 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 to and I'm sure the fact that Hitler was an Austrian uh, had something to do with that. And they're both Germans, and we're reuniting Germany, and you know, it was like, yeah. So Austria supported them, open arms, enlisted in the German army at, the, at about the same rate as any other German, as the rest of Germany. And so yeah, so yeah. And then Germany seized the Sudetenland, which was um, predominantly German areas in Czechoslovakia, which, you know, okay, I, I, I can see that, I can understand that. But the problem is, 
the Nazi economy was such a basket case that it was not going to survive unless it did one of two things, that it, that it could absorb another country and then just rape it of its resources or go to war. And so, and so what did Nazi Germany do, do in 1939? Well, it uh, threatened to invade Czechoslovakia. It already took the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia. So Hitler meets up with the prime minister of Czechoslovakia and basically says, all right, we got a bunch of you know tanks and divisions all around the perimeter of uh, Bohemia, and we're gonna you know shoot straight to Praha, to Prague, and you know and and we're just gonna bowl you over and it's gonna be terrible for your people, and so you and so we can have this nasty ass war, or you can hand over your country. And the prime minister of Czechoslovakia, obviously not realizing that Hitler. Um, obviously not realizing what was to come, um, agreed. And, and, and Germany just uh, took Czechoslovakia without any resistance. Now, Great Britain at this time, Great Britain and France, they had, you know, there was World War I, and they didn't want a repeat of World War I. They didn't want a repeat of something as bad as that. And so they were looking to avoid war, and so... They didn't intervene for Czechoslovakia, but then they but then they made a pact. They basically said, "Okay, any country at this point that gets attacked by Nazi Germany will be defended by Britain and France. Any country that gets attacked by Nazi Germany, we will then attack, declare war on Nazi Germany." That's what Britain and and France said. Now this puts uh, Hitler at a very difficult position. He, you know. Nazi Germany sees Czechoslovakia was, you know, sucking out a bunch of, sucking out their blood to, you know, furnish their insane economic policies that was, that would, that was going to lead Germany to economic collapse. So, but Hitler now has a problem that Britain and France will declare war on them whenever Nazi Germany declares war on any other country. At this point, Poland is actually committing uh, pretty bad atrocities against the uh, German minority in uh, uh, West Prussia, in, uh, in the German part of Poland at that time. And so, and so given that Poles are committing atrocities against the German minority in Poland, Hitler is now at a very tough situation, partly of his own making because of hit, because of what he did to uh, Czechoslovakia. Basically, it's like, all right, if I don't declare war on Poland, if I don't go in and, and help these Germans out, well, then the German minority is just going to keep getting slaughtered. And I, and it's not an insignificant amount of Germans in that area who were being killed. I mean, it, it, it was pretty bad what was going on, what the Poles were doing in that area. And so he was basically saying, well, if we don't go in, then those Germans are just going to keep getting slaughtered. If we go in in a complete surprise attack, surprise to the world, well, then we're going to be, we're going to find ourselves at war with Poland, France, and Britain, and possibly the Soviet Union. And if we go to war with France, Britain, Poland, and the Soviet Union, we're going to get smacked around. Now, at the time, the Polish army was about the same size as the German army at the time. Of course, it was, you know, completely outmoded and, you know, out-trained by the German army, so they just cut them to bits. But, uh, but considering, you know, going to, and, and at the time, this, before the Soviet campaign in Finland, so it wasn't, so it wasn't completely revealed to the world just how ineffectual the Soviet army was. Everyone, the world bit was basically looking at the Soviet army and saying, wow, that's a really big army. It's really big. And so a lot of people just saw how, how big it was, not realizing that it's a big old pig. It's a big old stinker of an army. And so Hitler was basically saying, well, if I don't invade Poland, the Poles are going to keep committing these atrocities. If I invade Poland, just completely surprise the world, I could be at war with Poland, the Soviet Union, France, and Britain. So what I need to do is, and I can't just go into Poland and seize the territories and seize the German 
uh, part of Poland. I can't just seize the German minority part of Poland because if I do that, then basically what I'm saying is tanks drive to the, I can't just have the tanks stop in mid-battle, you know, I can't just have the troops stop in mid-battle, otherwise it would be like, you know, because that's what happened in Vietnam, basically saying, all right, attack to this point, but don't advance any further. So what it does is it eliminates your ability to rout the enemy and you, and so the Polish army would be able to regroup, launch a counterattack. You know, they could basically just poke into the German minority territory and then pop out and poke in, pop out, and, and it would just be a complete mess. So basically said, all right, well, we can't do that. So basically we have to drive to Warsaw. But the problem is, what's the Soviet Union going to do? So... Hitler realized, well, I got to make a deal with the Soviet Union. So so we're going to make a deal and we're going to carve up Poland with the Soviet Union. Since we, Nazi Germany, we're doing the bulk of the fighting, we're going to take the bulk of Poland. And which they did. They drove all the way to Warsaw and took Poland. And so they did this in order to protect the German minority. And, uh, and I look, I know they're not saying, so I know probably to rape, um, suck out a bunch of resources from Poland as well. And so they did that, and then they found themselves at war with France and Britain. Now that war with France and Britain, Germany didn't want <laughs> Germany didn't want war with France and Britain any more than France and Britain wanted that war. And that's why he had the Sitzkrieg. That's why he had Germany not going to war. <clears throat> that's also why Germany didn't respond to the French invasion of Germany. Um, in 1939. Uh, it, it's a little uh, not very well-known fact that the French actually made something of an incursion into the Rhineland while Germany was invading Poland. Uh, it wasn't a very big incursion, but the Germans didn't respond to it, and the reason they didn't respond to it is because they did, the last thing they wanted was a full-scale war with France on the Western Front. And so that's the situation Germany's in right now. And at this point, during the, during the Sitzkrieg, uh, Russia was at war with Finland, and it was becoming revealed just how cosmically ineffectual the Soviet army was at this time. And so a lot of German military strategists were like, okay, it really is a paper tiger. The Soviet Union really is a paper tiger. But at this point, during the Sitzkrieg, Britain starts making moves against Norway, or, or not against Norway, with Norway against Germany. Nor they're basically trying to bring Norway into the war on the side of France and Britain in one way or another. Uh, perhaps not directly, but it is known that uh, the Norwegians loaned a large portion of their merchant marine to, uh, to Britain and was also allowing the British fleet to use uh, Norwegian bases and I think we're actually allowing them to use their air bases, um, naval air bases or something like that. So Norway, while, while not at war with Nazi Germany, was pretty clearly siding with Britain at the time. Germany got most of its iron at the time from um, the Rhineland, obviously, and from an iron belt in northern Sweden. The problem is the Iron Belt from northern Sweden traveled through the port of Narvik, which is in Norway. So it traveled from Sweden to the port of Narvik, down the Norwegian course, coast, to Hamburg. And so down the Norwegian coast to Hamburg. And so basically, Norway, uh, the port of Narvik in Norway, controlled the valve of the German iron supply. And Britain was in talks with Norway to um, deny um, Germans access to the port of Narvik, which would basically deny them access to like half their iron supply and basically cripple them for the war effort against France and Ger France and Britain. And so what? Did, and so Germany saw what was about to happen. And so what did Germany do? Well, they invaded. Norway. But in order to get to Norway, they had to invade Denmark. Now, we can sit here uh, philosophically and say, yeah, Germany should not have invaded Denmark because Denmark did not have any aggression or anything like that. But, you know, these are the, these are not, these are Nazis, all right? These are not, you know, 
these are guys willing to crack some eggs to say the least and so they invade Denmark and then they invade Norway and a lot of and there was a great debate going on in Britain at the time because very quickly uh, the Germans captured Oslo, Stavanger, uh, Trondheim, and drove through the Lillehammer Valley pretty damn quick. Uh, a lot, lot faster than the British thought because, oh, it's the rocky terrain. It's going to be, yeah, well, there's like two people in Norway, so <laughs> this is not a whole lot of defense. And so the British were actually pretty surprised at how quickly the Germans uh, overran most of Norway. But the Germans didn't relax. The Germans didn't take off steam there. When they captured, even though they captured most of Norway, because the whole point of the Norwegian campaign had nothing to do with Norway, but had everything to do with Narvik, and that's also why the British, you know, a lot, uh, most of the British troops didn't arrive until after most of Norway was spoken for, but they kept sending troops. Why? Because the battle wasn't about Norway; the battle was about Narvik. And so there was a bunch of intellectuals in Britain saying, well, why did we send all these troops to Norway, you know, to when the Germans captured most of Norway and, and you know, some, some drivel about, about that, basically not realizing that the battle for Norway was about, the, was about Narvik. And so the fighting didn't stop until the Germans captured Narvik, and that's why, and that's why Germany invaded Denmark. That's also why Germany invaded Norway. And the ridiculous thing, and this is like the fog and friction of war. This is just the hash of war. This is like, you know, you go to war, you have no idea what's going to happen. All sorts of crap happens when you go to war. So Germany invades uh, Denmark and Norway. The architect of the failed, you know, and pretty spectacularly failed uh, defense of Norway was a man by the name of Winston Churchill, the same man who engineered the disastrous uh, attack on the Dardanelles uh, against the Ottoman Empire. So Winston Churchill's uh, military leadership um, record is, is pretty uh, pretty fantastically bad. And so he um, was the architect of, of the uh, Norwegian debacle and also the architect of the Dardanelles de debacle. And because of the weakness of the German Prime Minister at the time. I don't. I don't know if it was Neville Chamberlain still, but anyway, uh, Churchill was appointed Prime Minister uh, because he was a, a, a war guy, and and so and <laughs> and that basically said, all right, the Western Allies are now in it for the long run against uh, Nazi Germany because Britain, because Churchill was uh, all the way for the war, you know, straight through all the time, and so Hitler was basically saying, all right, they they've made. Winston Churchill, their prime minister, Britain's in the war, we need to invade, we're going to invade um, Western Europe in the summer. And they did. And so they invaded Belgium and Luxembourg because, you know, Belgium and Luxembourg were the way you get through France uh, because the Germans couldn't get through the Maginot Line very effectively. And a lot of people go, what? I thought the Maginot Line sucked. Yeah, it sucked because they went around it. But the Maginot Line, the Maginot Line actually worked pretty well. You know, it, it, it defended the area that it was meant to defend very well. The Germans had a very difficult time getting through the Maginot Line. That's a lot of thing a lot of people forget. A lot of people remember the fact that the Germans went around it, not realizing that the Maginot Line prevented the Germans from coming straight through to France, but it didn't matter. And so that's why Germany invaded Belgium and Luxembourg, because they you know, had to get to get to France and Nazis, you know, obviously willing to crack some eggs to make an omelet. Holland. Holland. Why did Germany invade Holland? Well, you know, Dutch people today will say, it's because the Nazis were so horrible and they were so terrible and they were just out to get us and they were just out to get the world and do all this stuff and blah de blah de blah. And they'll say that, but the thing is, there was enough of a fifth column in Holland at that time for the Germans to capture a lot of uh, key bridges and key points, and 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 a lot of the fighting was was a lot easier in Holland because there was a, a a large number of infiltrators, and the Dutch army at the time was really small and really pathetic. 
and I, I wouldn't be surprised if the fifth column in Holland was, you know, <laughs> was a, of a comparable size to the Dutch army in Holland. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. But I do know that Holland was the nation with uh, the, the most, with one of the most um, volunteer units in the Waffen-SS. So, so they had a pretty sizable fifth column that enabled the invasion of Holland, and they also constituted the largest foreign element of the Waffen-SS. And, you know, that it's kind of looking a lot like Austria. You know, a lot of Austrians say, oh, we were bullied into joining Nazi Germany. No, you weren't. And I'm looking at Holland and thinking, nah, Dutch, maybe not so much. The firebombing of Rotterdam. The German commander met up with the Dutch commander and said, we're going to firebomb Rotterdam unless you surrender. The Dutch commander kind of wavered and said, I don't know if I want to surrender. I don't know if they're really going to do it. And then what happened is, is uh, he was wavering, and so the German commander said, all right, firebomb Rotterdam. And then after he gave the order to firebomb Rotterdam, then the Dutch commander said, okay, okay, I surrender, I surrender. And so then the German commander said, call the bombers back. And they tried to call the bombers back, but for whatever reason, the bombers couldn't, they couldn't get through to the bombers, and so they firebombed Rotterdam. Uh, so, yeah, that's how, that's how that happened. Um say what you want that that is. I think it's terrible. I think they shouldn't have bombed bomb Rotterdam at all. I think they shouldn't have gone to war at all, obviously. I don't think they should have existed at all. I obviously don't think any state should exist at all because I'm an anarchist, but just going along with the gag for now. And so that's where they're at. So that's where Nazi Germany's at. Kind of... And, and it's all... And it, and it can all be traced back to Adolf Hitler absorbing Czechoslovakia. You know, it can all be straight back to that. And then Britain promising to, to go to war with Nazi Germany if they invaded anyone else. And so at this point, Nazi Germany basically figures, okay, we won the war, now let's try to get Britain to surrender. But Britain was not surrendering. And Hitler couldn't figure out, why the hell would Britain not surrender? I mean... They don't have industrial capacity comparable to us. They don't have population comparable to us. They're not going to be able to wage a sustained war against us for an, for an indefinite period of time. There's no chance in hell they're going to beat us, beat us. And so, basically, what Hitler figured: Jews. They're going to try to get the Soviet Union in, into the war. And so he realized, and so, and also at the time, Stalin had seized a province in Romania, and Romania was uh, one of these fascist states. Uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Italy were also fascist states as well, aligned with Nazi Germany. So Stalin had seized a province in Romania, and Britain wasn't surrendering to Nazi Germany. And Hitler put two and two together and basically figured Britain is trying to get the Soviet Union into the war. And apparently Britain thinks that there's a good chance that the Soviet Union is going to get into the war. And if the Soviet Union launches a uh, massive, sustained uh, surprise attack on Nazi Germany, well, they then they could, you know, get pretty far, pretty close to Germany and, and really put us back into the pressure cooker. And so Hitler said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to invade the Soviet Union. And that's why he invaded the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, he had to do it a month too late because Italy invaded Yugoslavia and he had to bail them out because Italy just sucks at war. And so that's how that happened. And so that's how they invaded the Soviet Union. And then the war happened and then Germany declared war on America because they figured, because they made a deal with Japan, basically said, okay, Japan, if you invade the Soviet Union from the east, then we will declare war on the United States. Uh, Germany held up their part of the deal, Japan did not, and that was that. <laughs> and so, and then the war progressed and Germany lost. Now, looking at, looking at it from just that perspective, I look at that and I see, well, Nazi Germany is a bad guy. They really are. I mean, they seized Czechoslovakia for that. But, you know, the invasion of Poland, they had a modus operandi. 
they didn't endear themselves very well because they killed a bunch of uh, um, Jews and political dissidents, dressed them up in Polish uniforms or military uniforms, shot them and said, oh, the Poles are invading us. <laughs> and, and really had not a whole lot of respect for the sovereignty of other nations uh, invading Yugoslavia and Greece. Um, so, so Nazi Germany, and, and they had a basket case of an economic policy. But I look at that, and you know what I see? I see a dictatorship acting pragmatically. And, and because it was led to a large extent by one man, it acted a lot more erratically than than a more, I guess you could say, councilly governed country such as the Soviet Union, which survived a lot longer. And and there are a lot of war atrocities that the Nazis committed, you know, um, particularly saying, all right, we're going to kill X amount of French civilians for every day that the French resistance doesn't turn itself in, all that stuff. So there's, you know, all sorts of nasty stuff that happens with war, and and it's basically what happens when you have when you have a a, a group of people who are holier than thou, a group of people who believe that they are the uh, country through which the world spirit is going to enact itself through. It's all this Hegelianism. And they basically say, we're on a mission, we're absolutely righteous, everything we do is right, and we were wronged in the past, and all that stuff. And and, and this uh, holier-than-thou kind of thinking really, you know, excuses a lot of bad behavior. It excuses a lot of bad behavior in Western Europe. And if we are to go by what the Russians said, we would believe that they were just absolutely monstrous against the Russians. The problem with this narrative of German atrocities in the Soviet Union is that I, is that we know for a fact that the Soviets did dress up in German uniforms and go behind German lines and then kill a whole bunch of uh, you know and kill a whole bunch of civilians and always left it a few to survive to tell the story about just how savage and just how terrible the Germans were. So you had the Soviets who do something like that. You also had, and I also know that the Soviets themselves committed horrendous atrocities, uh, atrocities that can be documented every bit as well as Nazi atrocities, and how many Nazi atrocities documented by the Soviets weren't real or exaggerated or or perpetrated by the Soviets themselves in Nazi uniforms. We, I mean, we don't know because the Soviet Union, they wrote the history. They wrote the history of that war. So we don't know how much they made up. And given, given the track record of the honesty of the Soviet Union, I think it's safe to assume that they made a whole lot of crap up. The Holocaust. Obviously, there was a Holocaust, but I will just say this. The six million number is a political number, okay? The six million number was around during World War One. You had a bunch of Zionist organizations saying that six million Jews were uh, killed in, pro in pogroms, and, and that was the justification for the, for the Jewish state in the Mandate of Palestine. And, and since they had the Balfour Declaration, it was like that was the... Um, that was alrighty then that's the end of what we want to say today I hope that you enjoyed it thank you for supporting the Realities Temple on Earth ministry I'll see y'all on the flip flop and uh, take it easy again thank you for your support of this ministry and uh, your views and like I say as always Respect you. And I'm already 5,000. Till next time, y'all.